We're now on Dafla Mechesa Mechbeis, and Rabbi Eliezer is explaining why he permits the Madir to feed the non-kosher animal of the Mudar. Says Rabbi Eliezer, in the case of a behemoth, may a nafsha legufa l'shamayim. Even if he shechts the animal, not only does HaKadosh Baruch Hu take back the neshama, the, I shouldn't say neshama, but the nefesh, the life force of the animal, but he also takes away the goof of the animal because the violin are not allowed to eat the carcass, the animal, after shkita because it's a non-kosher animal. And the obvious counter-argument of the Chachamim is that the Bailim could sell the animal or sell the carcass. On the low, Chacham responds and counter argues, Even though the Tmeya, you're right, after Shkita, its nefesh belongs to the higher spheres in the heavens, but the goof is yours. So he can benefit tremendously from the carcass of the animal. And now the mother fattens up the animal, and the fatter it is, the more it's worth on the market to feed Goyim or to feed the, the, the animal. The Gemara says that there are other situations in which the Madir is allowed to give Hanot to the Muda. Omar of Yitzhak bar Hananya, Omar of Huna Hamudar Hanot Mechaber Muto Lahasi Lo Es Bito. He's allowed to marry off his daughter to the son of the Muda. But we'll see, the Gemara is going to go back and forth exactly who is marrying off to whom. Is the Madir to the Muda or go the other way around? Habiba, Rabbi Zera. Rabbi Zera asks the following question. Rabbi Askini, what is the exact scenario in which Rabbi Buddha came up with this land, you know, this remarkable heter? If the Father of the Kala was the Madir, and he imposed the Neder on the Chasan, that the Chasan will not be allowed to benefit from his Nechasan, is Harei Moser Lo Shivcha Lashamsha. The Father is being Mahana bin Isuin by giving the daughter a Shivcha. In other words, Rav Zera is assuming that the din of Rav Huna ap applies to a young girl who's a Ketana or a Nara, and she needs her father's agreement to get married. So that the father of the Kala is now being Mahana the Chasan, by agreeing to give over his hand, the daughter's hand to marriage. And that's being Mahana in these Nesuin. Shemosa Lo, he gives his daughter Kishiv Chalashamsho. Again, this is not politically correct, this language of the Gemara, but it means that now the husband has a Shivcha, so to speak, meaning. A wife is obligated to take care of the needs of the, of the house and serve her husband. So by giving over his daughter, and it's his das to decide, in the case of Tano Naira, to agree and approve for the marriage, he's basically being Mahana, the chasan, by giving the chasan a wife. So therefore, Rabbi Zera con concludes that it couldn't be that the heter of Afuna applies in a case where the Madir had prohibited his Nechassim onto the Mudar, the Aviyakala. I'm sorry, onto the, onto the Aviyakhasim. El, it must be the reverse. Benichse Chasan Asurim al Aviyakala. The Chasan was Madir, the father of the Kala, from his Nechassim. And in this case, Rav Huna permitted the Mudar, which is the father of the Kala in this scenario, to marry off his daughter to the Madir. Now, the Mudar is getting Hanoi here because the Chasan has to support his wife within the framework of the Ksuba. So therefore, 
we still don't understand Rav Huna's heter. However, here, what the Gemara is going to do is, I mean, this is Rabbi Zeyer's objection to Rav Huna. Rav Zeyer is going to have a Kavachomer based on our Mishnah to derive this heter. And therefore, the question on Rav Huna is going to be Pshita. What did Rav Huna add that I, didn't, I couldn't have derived from our Mishnah? So now we're going to analyze Rabbi Zeris Kalvachomer from our Mishnah, which would certainly conclude the law of Rav Huna, and therefore the law of Rav Huna is implicit in the Mishnah. And Dolavizu, we find in the Mishnah an even greater finish to be Mater, a Mater, and a, a Mater, and a Mudar. Amru, the Mishnah tells us, Zanes Ishtoves Bana that the Madir is permitted to support the wife and the children of the Muda. And the Mishnah says explicitly, even though the Muda, as the husband and the father, is obligated to support his wife and his children. The At Amr, and you feel it's necessary to tell me, that he's allowed to marry off his daughter to him? That's not a Kiddush. That I can derive certainly from a Kalvachom for the Mishnah. If the Mishnah is Matir and permits the Matir to support the wife and the children of the Mudar, even though the Mudar is Chayab and Mizonos, how much more so that we can be Matir, Leinose, Lebito Shalad Mudar, Velazuna. To be matir, to marry off his daughter. So again, now we're talking about a case of what? Of Nitzay Chasan Asurim Al Avi Kala. And we said that now the Chasan is going to support his wife, who's now the daughter of the Mudar. Kolshkein Sheesh Lahatilo, Linase Lebito Shal Mudar, Velazuna, certainly. We're going to permit the, the uh, Madir, the son of the Madir, to, be, to marry the daughter of the Mudar because he's only going to support her after he becomes obligated in Mizonos. And he says here, Velo bizman chiyuvo shel hamudar. In other words, there's no moment in time where both chiyuvim overlap. The chiyuv of the chasan to support his wife and the chiyuv of the father of the kala to support his daughter. There's no overlap whatsoever. Why? Because the moment that the marriage is chal, the husband becomes obligated to support his wife. But at that moment, the father of the kala becomes exempt from supporting his daughter. So therefore, the chassan didn't give any hana to the kala, meaning the father of the kala, by supporting the daughter of the, of, of, the, of the muda, because at that point in time, once the marriage is clinched, the muda is not obligated to support his daughter. The Mishnah was machadish, a greater fish, that you could support the mother could support the children, the wife and the children of the Mudar, even when the Mudar is obligated to support his wife and children. So now the Gemara goes back to the original interpretation of Rav of Rav Huna. We Olam, we're going to interpret Rav Huna, that the Aviyakala was Madir, the Chosen, that he shouldn't benefit from his Nechosen. And now the question is, what a greater benefit that could there be than marrying off his daughter to the chassan and she's going to be Mishamishin? But the answer is that she is not a katana or a nara the way we originally understood it, but she's a bogeres. She has already left the rishus of the father and she can marry off her, herself. So when the father gives over his daughter to the chassan, for marriage, then 
that's a meaningless action because legally she's a Bulgarian, she's on her own, independent of her father. It's her das that will determine the marriage. So the father is not being Mahana the Mudar because she made her own decision to marry off, to marry the, the son of the Mudar. Tanya Nami Hoki, a Mudar Anomi Chabero, Osur Lahasi Lobito, a Masia Lo, Bito Bulgaris, and we die. Om Rav Yaakov, a Madir Bino, Little Torah. The father is concerned that his son is distracted with all sorts of good things. You know, he's doing chesed. But it's going to distract him and, and detract from his son's concentration in Torah. And therefore, he says to the, to the son, I'm imposing a, a, a nether upon you that don't do any work for me. Meaning, even though you're my son and you're obligated to the mitzvah of Kibbut Av, I'm being mad to you that you should not get involved at all in Kibbut Av because that's going to create a bitter Torah. Now, what the Gemara is going to about to say here, the name of Yaakov, is that to what extent, what kind of malachas can we categorize as malachos that are so time-consuming that they would undermine the ability of the son, if he does these malachas on behalf of his father, to concentrate in learning. There are malachas katanos that are very simple. You know, you turn on the light switch, you know, that doesn't create any bitul Torah. It's there for butul, these tashmishim katanim of either filling up a barrel of water or turning on a candle, those would not cause bitul Talmud Torah, and they were not included in the scope of the net. They were, the father never intended to prohibit those malachas. Rabbi Yitzchak, Omar, Litzoslo, Dad Kotan. And even to fry a uh, small sardine, that is muta because that is a quick job and will not interfere with his Talmud Torah, and it wasn't included in the net. Omar, do you remember Rabbi Yochan? A person who's mudar is allowed, nevertheless, to be mashke a koshal shol. What is a koshal shol? <coughs> My ni What is a koshal shol? And here. We have a difference between Bavel and Eretz Yisrael. In Bavel, they interpreted Koshal Shalom in one way, and in Eretz Yisrael, a different way. Hacha, here in Bavel, I'm talking to Talmud Bavli, Tigubu, they explain Koshal base oven. There was a minog that the oven would drink X number of cups of wine, and that wine was given within the context of Nichom Avelim. And by the way, the Yemenites to this day have this minog, and it goes in increment. They give one cup on the first day of Avelis, two on the second day, and it gets more and more and more. Hopefully the other won't get drunk. But the people who come to be Menachem, they participate in this post, so to speak, and they drink the coast with them. Anshe Shlomo Boim Lenachemo Veshosim Esakos Imo, that's called the Kosh Shel Shon. That's in Baba. The Marava Amri, in Eretz Yisrael, they said, what is koshal shalom? Koshal based on merchats. When a person comes out of the merchats, like there's a whole culture built around the bote merchatsot. And when he left the base on merchats, he would drink a koshal shalom. It means others in the chabura, who are part of this whole very close, tight-knit group of all of them, when they would leave the base on merchats, they would share a koshal shalom. And why is there a heter here in Mudra no? Because this is all considered darke shon. And when the nether was taken by the madir, he did not include that which is under the category of darke shon in his nether. The Mishnah says, Lo yozun es behemto, ben, according to Tanakam, it's mea ben tahore. Rabbi Eliezer says, no, he's allowed to feed the behemot me. Tanya, Yeshua Ish Uza Omer, Zan Avada Vishibkos of Aknani. The Madir is allowed to feed the 
servants, male and female, non-Jewish servants, meaning an Ebed Knani or a Shifra Knanis, of the Muda. Now we have to understand, and this is going to shed a very important light on Rabbi Eliezer, that we're talking about Yeser Mikdei Chayehem. In other words, there's a certain amount of food that's necessary to sustain a person so he doesn't die of starvation. That's not the discussion here. The discussion is to give surplus food, extra food. Are you allowed as a madi to a mudar to offer the shvachos and the avadim of the, the mudar extra food, surplus of food? And even Rabbi Eliezer, the Ran points out, was not matir for the madir to fatten up the animal of the mudar if he's giving the food that's kidei chaya, the food that the animal needs to survive. What Rabbi Eliezer permitted was to go beyond kidei chaya. Below yazin es tehemto bein tmea u bein tahora. However, says Yoshua ish uza in the Brisa, like the Chachomim in our Mishnah, that although you're allowed, the man is allowed to feed the Evan and the Shivcha of the Muda, but he's not allowed to feed the animal, whether it's kosher or non-kosher of the Muda. My time, what's the difference between Avodah and Shivchosa of the Muda that you're allowed to feed them? The man is allowed to be Zan them, and yet he's not allowed to be Zan the Behemoth of the Muda. And the more answers, in the case of an of an Evid Veshivcha, what are you going to gain? What does the Mudar Anon benefit from the fact that his Evid or Shivcha is now fat? You know, you, you added flesh. Uh, what are you saying? That after the death of the Shivcha, he's going to sell the, the, the human body like for a cannibal? Right? You're not allowed to eat the human body. And this is all a phrase. This is all a kind of a metaphor to explain, as the Ran explains it, that the purpose of an Evan and a Shivcha is to clean up the house. And it, there's, there's nothing added here, nothing benefiting here for the Muda if his Evan or Shivcha are fat. I guess the fatter people have it more difficult to clean up the house. The Rush interprets it that the reason he wants to have these Avadim work for him, we're talking about the Mudar, is Lemaris Ayin Ulchvod Ulshamish Lafadim. Like it's a big deal, you know, it's a status symbol if you have Avadim and Shivchos that work for you. Ain't Sarkhafitumo, they don't have to be fat. And then he quotes Rabbeinu Avram in Ahar that with the Gemara has in mind is that. The evidence sold reflect the value of the evidence a reflection of his reasons of his very uh, you know his alacrity and his avoda. He's not assessed and evaluated by his fat. You know we're not going to take a tape measure and see how fat his belly is. That doesn't add anything any reva to the value of the animal. But in the case of behema, the behema is sold on the market according to its Weight according to its fatness. The Mishnah says, and now we're going to get into the whole sugi of mitzvahs bikur cholim. So now the madir is coming to visit the mudar and cheer him up because the mudar is sick in bed and he's allowed to do so. Why? Because he's standing. Omen. Avalo Yoshe, the Madir is not allowed to sit down next to the bed of the Mudar in order to be Mavakir Chol. The Gemara is going to explain the distinction. Umerapo, if the Madir is a doctor, a physician, or a psychologist, is Rafuas Nefesh Alo Rafuas Mo. He, the Madir, is allowed to offer all these services to the Mudar except for one except for Rufus Mama, in other words, to 
serve as a veterinarian for the Mudar's behema, that already is adding value, monetary value to the to the to the money and the assets of the Mudar, and that's considered a Hanno. But as far as Liraposo, that's already a mitzvah and not a Hanno. And the Gemara here on Daflam and Tess is going to try to explain the case of Bikr Cholim and what's the difference between Omid and Yosha. Because in both cases, presumably the Mavakir will fulfill the mitzvah. And if that is Mavkir, the Yisra Hanna, then it should apply even in the case of Yosha. And this Gemara that unfortunately, I don't know if we'll get a chance to learn it together. It's the Shabbos now, Lama Tess. This Gemara is the basis for chaplaincy. What do I mean? Like my father was a chaplain in Coney Island Hospital for half a decade, half a century. And he got a salary for that. Basically, his job was to cheer up the Jewish patients in the hospital. So does that mean he lost the mix of Bikr Kol? But the answer is no. If he stands on two feet, how are you doing? How was the surgery yesterday? Then, in that case, he's not allowed to take money because he'll forfeit his mitzvah. But if he sits down and he spends a little time with the chola, then he's allowed to take money. So the clergyman who gets paid for being a chaplain, a Jewish chaplain in a hospital, and he doesn't want to forfeit the mitzvah bigger chola, he should come in to see the chola and then sit down next to him. Because in that sense, he's going beyond the basic obligation of Bikr Cholim, and for that, he doesn't undermine his mitzvah if he takes a sound. Okay, then? Let me take this opportunity and wish you a great Shabbos, and the Mitzvah Shem will reconvene on Sunday morning. Shabbat Shabbat.